Professor Yolanda Abulu. Yolanda is a nurse practitioner in the School of Nursing and also director of the Office of Global Health. She grew up right next door in West Baltimore. And she's here today to discuss social connections yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yolanda, tell us about social connections. Thanks everybody, so grateful to be here, a place where I just love to be. There's a sign outside of the School of Nursing um, that lists the University of Maryland, Baltimore's core values. And as I walk by that sign, I'm always like so happy to see that hashtag UMB to the core. I, I love that hashtag UMB to the core because it reminds me of growing up in Baltimore. Um, there was a statement that we used to say in Baltimore, Baltimore to the core. In this phrase, there's a message of deep love for our city, for its beauty and good times and bad. So I'm extremely blessed to be at home in Baltimore and at UMB. As a child, I walked up and down that very street behind you. It's where I shopped. It's where I passed to go to my favorite place, the library on Cathedral Street. The library was my safe haven. It's where I had reading books and old newspapers. Looking back now, I look around in this neighborhood and out here, and so much has changed. So much has changed, including me. Being here with you in person is really exciting. I could feel the energy as we processed in, and it's just so exciting to be here with everybody in person. It's hard to believe that we couldn't do this. For nearly three years, so many of us have been unable to connect with one another. Many of us have experienced total social isolation at times, and if not partial, like so many of you, I miss my loved ones, my friends, my colleagues that I wanted to just see in person and give a hug. My 79-year-old mother who still lives in West Baltimore refused to let me in her home for a whole year. Instead, she opted to just wave hello to me from her door. I called her, I sent her virtual hugs, I sent her a text message, but nothing could take the place of seeing her in person. We all have our stories because isolation impacted all of us during COVID. In fact, social isolation became a household word. I felt it, you felt it, we all felt it. But what if social isolation was a way of life? What if those social disconnections continued long-term? What if you continue to be isolated from family and friends? What if you were afraid to let your child out to play because you know that that boom sound you just heard was not a car backfiring? What if you're an aging adult that prefers to hide behind a bolted door rather than go see your primary care provider because you have to catch two buses and take a two hour journey just to get your blood pressure checked. This depicts what social isolation looks like in my childhood neighborhood. Experiences with social isolation is concerning because social isolation is as deadly as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And it increases your risk of heart disease and premature death especially for people that were isolated as children. People in the neighborhood I grew up, they know what social isolation is. They understand its health impacts, the impact you now understand because of what you just went through during the pandemic. Because of my experiences as a child, I was really curious about social isolation as a nurse researcher. 
I wondered and I wanted to see if people continued to be socially isolated. And if so, I wonder what can we do about it? So prior to the pandemic, my research team and I started listening to community residents in West Baltimore to understand social isolation. In these conversations, community members share stories of good times, times when grandmothers brought everybody together, times when it was customary to know your neighbors. They remembered the beauty of Baltimore from the Afro clean block competition to the painted screens in East Baltimore. They recalled having meaningful social connections with families and neighbors. Their comments reminded me of my grandmother. You see, I used to catch the bus every Sunday to Cherry Hill to see my grandmother Eliza. She worked as a housekeeper in University Hospital, as we called it at that time. I would arrive, I would be so excited because she would immediately offer me candy and offer to play a game of cards. She purposely invested time and energy in me and in exchange she had pretty high expectations. She fondly called me Dr. Yolanda and insisted that when she was cleaning the patient's rooms, she heard them calling me overhead. Like many other grandmothers in my community, my grandmother believed that it takes a village to raise a child. My grandmother knew what I know now about Baltimore's greatest asset. The power of Baltimore is in its people. Growing up in West Baltimore, my neighbors looked out for me while my parents were at work. They encouraged me to do the right thing. My teachers encouraged me to let my light shine when I was too shy to even raise my hand and ask a question. And the local librarian on Cathedral Street, she answered all of life's toughest questions. Fast forward to my time here at UMB, I was very fortunate to have faculty and professors, many like you, like Jeff Johnson and Susan Wolzinski in the Hoot School of Nursing, who gave me the words to help me understand my life experiences. They introduced me to the concepts of social justice and health equity. And that really projected me to be able to do the work that I do now. These are the words that I use now to explain why so many of the negative experiences that I witnessed as a child are avoidable, they're unfair, they're unjust. It is my social connections though, with my professors, with my grandmother, with special mentors like Esther McCready, Shirley Nathan Pulliam, that open doors for a better tomorrow. Despite the strong connections of yesterday, many of the community members we spoke to reported that social bonds like those with our grandmother have diminished over time. They reported weakened social ties have occurred, not because of a personal choice or an individual problem, but because it's rooted in community design and in social injustice. One father said to me, Imagine living on a street with 20 houses. 12 of the homes are vacant. Four of them have elderly neighbors that are hid behind their door with fear of venturing out. So yes, I feel isolated. And as a parent daily, I worry about letting my children outside to play, even though I know making social connections is important. Where we live, Think about it, where we live impacts all the social connections that we're able to make. Baltimore is not alone in the challenges it faces. I've been fortunate to have a career in global health. And one of the things that I've learned is that there are cities like Baltimore all over the globe. And social isolation is not specific to Baltimore. It's a global epidemic and it's growing. So it's not just a challenge for older adults or something that just happened because of the pandemic. When we look around in Baltimore, it's been here, it's been here for years. Community members made it clear that they're not victims. 
They don't want our sympathy. They want action and recommended solutions to address the challenges. In our interviews, they ask that people like us in academia listen more before acting. They recommended creating safe spaces for them to convene, for them to mentor each other, for them to share and learn about their common experiences. They ask for community partners to advocate with them for increased access to affordable and safe housing, for reliable transportation, for better schools, and healthcare positioned right in their neighborhood. They imagined a day where they did not have to leave their community to get the social resources that they need. They wanted recreation centers for their children to play and effective local bus transportation. Imagine that. They are no different than us. They want what we want. They want places to connect. They want places to love. They want places to work and play. Let me share two projects at University of Maryland that I'm a part of that is examples of what we can do about this together. After listening to community members, we wanted to focus on belonging and well-being and thus the Belong to Baltimore program emerged. The program provided support groups and a family navigator to parents of young children from West Baltimore to increase social connections. And at the end of one year, families reported they felt more connected. They had diminished social need as it relates to food, housing, income generation, education, and better physical and mental health. And now there's a new project, the West Baltimore Rich Collaborative, which is a collaboration of hospitals, community-based organizations, all working together to reduce social isolation and hypertension in our neighboring community. Partnering with schools like Social Work, Stacy Stevens, she couldn't be here today, the School of Pharmacy, the School of Medicine, and the Masters in Public Health program has been instrumental. After all, collaboration is what we do at UMB. Most importantly, community members have been actively engaged, not just as participants, but as employees of our university and part of the research team. They keep us grounded, grounded and focused on the reality. They are the best. Some of them are here with us today. Janet North Kabor, our program manager, a resident of West Baltimore, she raised an interesting point with me recently about the need for tighter social connections between organizations and communities. She called for a movement above and beyond community engagement. Janet coined the term community marriage. She suggested the need or more, for a more deliberately publicly expressed long-term commitment. That's what we're doing at UMB. The time for innovation and discovery to address social factors that impact health is now. In this pivotal turning moment where we all understand social isolation and its negative impacts, now is the time to act. Some of you might be thinking right now that addressing social factors as I described is too big. Wow, those are huge problems that the work is beyond what we do at UMB, that the programs presented are ambitious, the expectations high, and the stakes high. Yes, the work is hard, but it's not impossible. After all, boldly facing critical challenges is who we are at UMB. Tackling big problems and finding solution is the soul of what we do at UMB. We were audacious enough to think we could make a difference in HIV, not just in the United States, but also abroad. We are bold enough to say we could find a vaccine for COVID, and I believe that we can boldly address the social factors that impact health, especially for our neighbors who just live blocks from where we're standing. We can all start by tightening our own social connection ensuring that staff, faculty, students that are in your environment feel like they belong here at UMB. Teaching social justice, health equity, 
in our curriculums, by hiring community members, and purposefully investing in community-centered innovation. This important work is being done because it's really important that as we look forward generations from now, that a girl who lives two blocks away from here can walk out of her home, hop on her bike, ride to UMB, stop at Lexington Market and get something to eat with her friends and then go to the library and check out a book, all without thinking that she wouldn't be able to do so. I'm optimistic for tomorrow, and I look forward to the future where we at UMB can look back and say that we played an important role in creating stronger social connections, not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors. Thank you. Dr. Yolanda, that was fabulous. It's a powerful, emotional message, and we can do that.